Good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Sloma. Welcome to today's New York State Archives presentation of More Than CDs and Thumb Drives, Real Life Stories and the Adventures of Preserving Digital Records. This session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box to the right side of your screen and we will answer them at the end of the, this presentation. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Michael Martin. Okay, thank you, Rich. Uh, I am here to introduce our two panelists. Thank you very much. Um, first we have Bonnie Weddle. Bonnie has worked for the New York State Archives for almost 23 years now. She cut her professional teeth improving archival documentation of mental health services in New York State and providing descriptive advice and technical assistance to New York's historical records repositories. She has been working with electronic records since 2004 and at present she's focused on ensuring that her colleagues are comfortable working with electronic records. So she's making sure everybody can work with the electronic records that are coming in. Uh, she's actively involved with the Council of State Archivists State Electronic Records Initiative, and occasionally she teaches electronic records workshops for various uh, archival professional organizations. So we know we got a real expert here. Uh, Maureen Reynolds, who will be going next uh, after Bonnie, is the county clerk for Tompkins County. And Maureen has worked with the Tompkins County Clerk's Office for 30 years. The county clerk's office handles all land records, the Freeman County court documents for the county, and serves as the RMO for all county departments. So you can see she has extensive experience with document management systems, grant writing, and has been a grant reviewer for the state archives. And generally, she says she plays well with others, which has allowed her to work with over 29, with, uh, 29 county departments. And now through a shared services approach with 16 municipalities in the county which has recently expanded to Cortland County and five of its municipalities. So we have people who work with electronic records on a daily basis, and we hope that that'll be helpful for everyone. And I am going to turn it over to Bonnie, and thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Before I dive into how we preserve electronic records, I just wanna provide you with a little bit of background information. Uh, most of you are familiar with the archives because of the scheduling and advisory services that we provide uh, and the grant program that we oversee, but we also preserve and provide access to colonial and state government records that warrant permanent preservation. We hold over 145,000 feet, cubic feet of paper and film-based records and analog audio and visual recordings. We also hold a growing volume of electronic records. We currently have almost six terabytes of electronic records that were transferred to us by agencies, some of which consist of Microsoft Word files, PDFs, databases, spreadsheets, and other records that were created and maintained in digital form. And others consist of agency-created scan, agency scans of paper records. Sometimes those come to us in tandem with the paper originals, and sometimes we hold only the digital copies. In addition, since December 2006, we've used a variety of tools and services to produce archival copies of state government websites. I'm really not gonna devote any time this morning to discussing uh, these records because they're created, maintained, and preserved separately from our other electronic records holdings. But we currently have about one and a half terabytes of website data. And the crawling that we're going to be doing in the wake of the November 8th election is going to add another 200 to 250 gigabytes of data to that collection. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have about how we copy websites or care for the copies during the Q&A section of this webinar. Some electronic records come to us, still come to us on CDs, thumb drives, and other forms of portable media. Ideally, such transfers are the result of discussions between the archives and the transferring agency. For example, the purple thumb drive you see on screen came to us after we and the transferring agency determined that the quantity of records involved was small, that the records themselves did not contain any legally restricted information, that a high capacity thumb drive um, was the easiest way for the agency to get the records to us, and that the records could be copied onto the thumb drive without altering any essential metadata. As you can see, the thumb drive itself is referenced in the memorandum of transfer that places the records in the legal custody of the archives. 
In other instances, archive staff have traveled to agency offices and copied records onto a portable hard drive, or agency staff have come to the archives uh, with hard drives containing uh, records that are coming, that are slated for transfer. In other instances, we find portable media in boxes transferred in conjunction with paper records. The box you see on screen is, thankfully, a rarity. A state commission ceased operations with very little advance notice, and all of its loose electronic media came to us in a couple of boxes, one of which you see on screen. Uh, we found boxes of disks and a handful of other transfers, but for the most part, we find the occasional piece of portable media nestled in a box of paper records. Staff who work with incoming transfers are on the lookout for portable media, and most of the time, we find the media shortly after the transfer takes place. An ever-increasing number of electronic records come to us online. Our parent agency's information technology department worked with us to set up a secure SharePoint site that several agencies have used to transfer records to us. And you can see uh, the home screen here. Uh, other agencies make extensive use of secure file transfer services in the course of conducting business. They're not familiar with SharePoint. Um, they want to use what they're comfortable with. So we'll gladly work with agencies to uh, accept records via the transfer service that they prefer. Needless to say, these online transfers are the end result of discussions between the archives and the transferring agency. Our SharePoint site is password protected. And agencies seeking to use other transfer services have to notify us in advance. After we receive or find electronic records, we do some initial processing work. If the records are on portable media, we use a hardware-based write blocker to protect against alteration of the data. And the write blocker that we use is the small white rectangular device that you see in at the top left of the image on screen. It sits between the floppy disk drive that you do see on screen and our processing computer, which you don't. Um, if the floppy, if the media has some sort of write protection tab or other uh, protective uh, device, um, we use that as well. We then determine whether the media is readable. If it's not, we document that fact. If it is, we keep processing the records. For all transfers, we assess the intellectual content of the records. Do the rec records match the transfer documentation? If they came to us in tandem with paper records, how do they relate to the paper records? Are they even records? Um, every now and then, we find a floppy disk in a box of paper records that contains birthday party invitations or other uh, files that are clearly not records. We also explore the directory structure. Our secure digital repository is cloud-based, and there are limits as to how much data we can push through our network at a given time. If we have to break a large transfer into multiple upload packages, we need to ensure that those packages preserve the original directory structure once they're moved into the repository and reassembled. We also examine the file formats. Are the files encoded in PDF, TIFF, or other formats that are widely used and likely to remain accessible, at least in the immediate future? Or are they encoded in obscure or obsolete formats that are at immediate risk of becoming obsolete and unreadable? Finally, we copy the records to a suitable local or network drive space. At present, we can't connect our SharePoint site to our digital preservation repository, so we have to move them onto a physical drive location that the repository can access. And the repository that we use is uh, provided by uh, Preservica. Preservica is actually a couple of things. Um, Preservica, the corporation, is a software company based in the United Kingdom. And Preservica, the system, is a comprehensive digital preservation repository developed by that company. When I say comprehensive digital preservation repository, what precisely do I mean? Preservica, the system, provides storage. One can opt to install Preservica software on one's own array of servers or have Preservica, the company, house data in the cloud. We use the cloud-based option, and our records are housed in Amazon Web Services Government Cloud Data Center, which meets federal requirements for secure storage of law enforcement, financial industry, and healthcare records. Most of the records in our holdings are not legally restricted, but we do have some that are, and Government Cloud provides the level of security that we need. In addition to providing secure storage, Preservica gives users a wide array of digital tools, including file format identification, ongoing identity integrity checks that ensure files remain intact and uncorrupted over time, and file migration workflows that enable users to convert files encoded in obsolete formats to newer ones. We use all of these tools. 
Um, Preservica also offers a couple of tools that we are, we're not using at this time. Preservica was developed to provide uh, ongoing care for records that weren't permanent preservation, but it now incorporates uh, retention tools that enable agencies or enable users to apply retention controls to records that have lengthy retention periods but which are not permanent. And it also has a public access web interface that we don't use because we have other means. Uh, for providing access to select digital records. Preservica also provides role-based access to the system. It's possible to grant someone the ability to view records but not do anything else, move new records into the system but not do anything else, migrate records in obsolete formats to newer formats but not do anything else, or to edit metadata but not do anything else. An individual user can be assigned more than one role, and most archives employees who work with Preservica have ingest, access, transform, and data management rights. Administrators have the rights associated with all of these other roles, can view some reports that other users can't, and can create and deactivate other users' accounts. The submitter role is intended for records creators who are transferring records to the repository, and users who have submitter rights can upload files to Preservica's staging area for repository staff review but can't access the system itself. As of November 2022, we haven't uh, given anybody submitter rights. Moving records into Preservica is a two-stage process. Records are first uploaded to a temporary staging area and then ingested into the system itself. As far as uploading records to the staging area is concerned, there are several ways to do so, and we use several of them. Uh, there are two desktop clients uh, client applications available. There's a web-based browser tool, web browser-based tool. Um, we're currently using the Upload Wizard client application and the web-based preparation and upload tool. It's also possible to save a zip file to a local or network drive and then point Preservica to it. We've made limited use of this mechanism in the past. Um, we have some trouble in our technical environment getting it to work consistently. Um, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, one can also assign the submitter role to agency personnel. Uh, who want to transfer records. Finally, uh, users of Preservica's cloud services can use an Amazon Snowball, which is a portable di device that can hold up to 80 terabytes of data, um, and then send the Snowball directly to the appropriate Amazon Web Services data center, where AWS staff will ingest it directly into Preservica. All of these mechanisms perform the same essential functions. They bundle records into a submission package that Preservica can process and generate checksums that will be used that the records remain very intact and uncorrupted as time progresses. Checksums are generated algorithmically. The algorithm totals up the individual zeros and ones that make up a digital file and generate an alphanumeric value. Applying the same checksum algorithm to the same file should yield the same alphanumeric value every single time. If so much as a one or zero in the file changes, the value generated by the checksum will change dramatically, and this is an indicator that the file has become corrupt or has decayed and needs to be replaced with an intact backup copy. The web-based preparation and upload tool enables one to view and arrange records in the staging area, and on screen you see some records that I'm currently working on. Um, it's a group of video files documenting Governor Kathy Hochul's first term of office. Owing to their size, I've put each file into a folder and uploaded it to the staging area, and then arranged them by month. We have yet to assign series and accretion numbers to this particular group of records, so for now I've identified them as the Governor Hochul videos. And I will put an archives accretion number into the project name field uh, before I move these records into Preservica itself. The preparation and upload tool allows users to specify where in Preservica the records should go. In this case, they're going into a folder named S3 ingest to add descriptive information if desired and to specify which algorithms should be used to generate the checksums that will be used for integrity checking. I've told the system to generate three checksums for each file using the SHA-1, SHA-256, and SHA-512 algorithms. This is almost certainly overkill, but I'm a cautious sort of person. Um, After the uploading process is complete, the records are, to use a bit of digital preservation jargon, ingested into Preservica. 
The workflow generates checksums for each file and verifies that they match those created by the upload mechanism, scans for viruses, identifies the file format present in the submission package, creates an archival package that contains a lot of technical metadata that Preservica extracts, um, places the archival package in secure storage, and deletes the submission package from the staging area. Every ingest workflow generates a report that is permanently added to the system's store of administrative data. And after the records are ingested into Preservica, we organize them first by series and by accretion. The archives groups all records regardless of format, first into series, and we assign each series a five-character numeric or alphanumeric code. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the rather blurry um, thumbnail images that you see on your screen, uh, I don't know what happened with that screen capture and I apologize for it, are agency created scans of paper records that were created by the former Long Island State Park Commission and which consist of brochures, leaflets, and other state park promotional materials. The number that we've assigned to this series is B2867. Many of our series grow as time progresses, and as a result, we divide records within a given series into accretions that reflect when a particular group of records was transferred to us. Uh, at present, we've gotten only one set of records, uh, one transfer of records associated with B2867, but more may be forthcoming. As a result, all the records that we currently have are grouped into accretion B2867-22. The dash 22 suffix reflects the fact that these records came to us in 2022. And if in 2024 we receive additional records uh, that are part of this series, they'll be grouped together as accretion B286724. Staff searching for paper records know that they need the accretion number in order to figure out uh, the box's shelf location. And those for looking for electronic records know that they need the accretion number in order to find the records in Preservica. At present, most of the descriptive information that appears in the finding aids and other access tools that, that we create are not present in Preservica. However, Preservica extracts and generates a wealth of technical information about each record in the repository. The record that you see on screen is a scan of a leaflet outlining the amenities, green fees, and yardage of the golf courses at Bethpage State Park, and it was created at some point in the 1940s or 1950s. Um, the file itself uh, was, uh, the, the scan itself was actually done in 2021. The record depicted above, um, sorry, uh, so uh, Preser as you can see, Preservica enables staff to view a copy uh, in full screen, um, to download a copy if they desire, and the advanced tab on the property screen uh, provides some additional information. It looks a little alien at first, but if you're familiar with Preservica's data model, you can see that this record was ingested into Preservica on August 9th of this year, and that Preservica determined that it is uh, encoded in tagged image file format. If you click on the history tab, you can determine, uh, you can access the report of the ingest workflow that led to this record's presence in the system, and determine that this record was one of a package of 29 that was ingested at around 5.31 p.m. on August 9th, and that I was the person who ingested this particular package of records. Preservica also enables users to generate a wide array of detailed reports about their holdings, including the file formats present in the repository. And I knew for a while before we began using Preservica that we had several varieties of Microsoft Word and several varieties of portable document format in our holdings. But Preservica has definitively identified five distinct versions of Microsoft Word and 11 distinct versions of portable document format. Um, it's also been able to, unable to identify the format of a few of the files in our holdings and its files not identified report enables us to take a look at those records and figure out what they are and how we need to uh, make sure that they remain readable over time. As you might expect, other reports document the amount of storage taken up by our holdings, and there are additional reports that document the workings of the system itself, including integrity checks, ingest activity, file and package downloads, staff logins, and file deletions over time. Finally, Preservica supports the long-term preservation of our holdings. First, it offers bit-level preservation through the integrity checks I mentioned a moment ago. If you place a file in Preservica, Preservica will ensure that every bit, every one and every zero that makes up a given file, 
remains intact and uncorrupted over time. It does so by maintaining multiple backup copies of each file, running regular integrity checks uh, on the primary copy, and replacing corrupted primary copies with uncorrupted backups as needed. Issues are flagged in the integrity check report, and you can see a sample report on your screen. Um, to date, uh, Preservica has not had to replace uh, any of the primary copies with a backup copy, and it's nice to know uh, that that is indeed the case. Second, Preservica has a host of built-in migration pathways that enable users to produce preservation-friendly versions of files encoded in formats that are obsolete or otherwise at risk of becoming inaccessible and creating metadata that documents the relationship between the original file and the migrated version. For example, users who have files encoded in Microsoft Word 1.0, which cannot be opened with any of the versions of Microsoft Word that are widely available at this time, can use Preservica's preservation workflows to produce HTML or PDF versions of these files. Preservica will preserve both the original Microsoft Word files and the HTML or, or PDF files and create metadata indicating that a given HTML or PDF file is a newer version of the corresponding Word file. Preservica has hundreds of migration pathways and adds more pathways on a regular basis, but every now and then we come across a file format for which no pathway exists. For example, a few years ago, we received a single DBase 3 file on a floppy disk along with a paper printout of the file's contents. I was able to copy the file, open it in Microsoft Excel, and confirm that the data in Excel matched that present in the printout. So what I did was I used Excel to create a comma-separated values version of the file, checked its correctness, and placed the CSV file and a copy of the original DBase 3 file into a specially constructed upload package. When I uploaded and then ingested this package into Preservica, Preservica recognized from the, the package structure that the CSV file was the offspring of the DBase 3 file, stored them as such, and created metadata documenting the relationship between the two. As I mentioned at the start of this presentation, the archives currently holds almost six terabytes of agency-created electronic records. Over four terabytes of those records were transferred to us this year. Looking to the future, we have every reason to expect that a steadily increasing number of electronic records will make their way to us. We're actively preparing for this future. We know that we need to purchase additional storage space and that doing so uh, has some purchasing implications. We are bumping up against some thresholds. Uh, we're also making sure that every archivist who handles incoming transfers of records knows how to process electronic records and is comfortable working with Preservica. We also have, uh, just like NASA, a, couple, a few ambitious exploratory missions underway. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, our SharePoint site is not connected to Preservica, which means that we need to download the records to a physical drive location and then move them into Preservica. Uh, we've determined that it may be possible to link our SharePoint site directly to Preservica and upload and ingest the records directly from SharePoint. We're currently gathering data about this novel terrain. Not quite sure it's going to happen, but I, for one, will be overjoyed if we can. In addition, uh, we use archive space to create finding aids and manage accession level information about the extent, technical characteristics, and preservation needs of all of our holdings. Um, linking archive space to Preservica would ensure that the descriptive and administrative information that we enter into the former is synchronized with the electronic records housed in the latter. Um, we're looking at how other repositories have linked these two systems, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Maureen. Good morning, everyone. Wait for my screens to come up here. Oops. All right. So I am the Tompkins County Clerk. I have worked here since 1989. Um, I grew up in a county clerk's office. I'm going to tell you about our journey. Next slide, please. So uh, I started looking at imaging in the mid 90s and. By 1999, we had started scanning the records in our office. Within 10 years, we had completely scanned every record in the county clerk's office. I'm not sure if you know about county clerk records, but we're like the ex-wife of all the baggage. We have rooms and rooms and rooms of records. So this was quite an accomplishment for us. 
Um, the reward for being so good at getting this done was the county decided to give us another building, the old Library and Active Records Center. Next slide, thank you. So they took our records and they put them in this dilapidated old library building where the roof leaked, you know, the sewers would overflow, um, it was falling down, and they put all the records in there. Great place for records. So we were tasked with uh, getting all these records uh, taken care of. And at the beginning, we thought, this is just too big of a project. We're going to have to tag the boxes and, you know, barcode them and, and, and uh, put the barcodes in software and just be in the business of moving boxes. Next slide, please. So we had 9,000 boxes in this falling down building. We had a horrible database. They said, here's the, the records. You get no staff, you get no, no more money. What can you do? So uh, we didn't want to be in the box retrieval and tracking of these boxes. So we went and started looking for software. Next slide. And what we did was um, we went and got software. Our software that we use is LaserFiche. And uh, because we had done all the scanning of the county clerk records before, I had a vendor, an imaging vendor already that I worked with that could do all the imaging of the records. Um, of course, I had to call my IT director and let him know what we were doing because I just can't dump, you know, millions of images every night into the county network without letting him know. And I used my existing staff to, you know, to move things around. And I didn't realize it until I turned 50, but I became a project manager. So in the end, it took us two years, and what we did was we created a digital record center. We scanned the 9,000 boxes. We eliminated the need for a new building to house a record center, which the county had been looking at. Um, we saved the county five and a half million dollars by not building a building. We didn't need security. We didn't need utilities. You know, we didn't need people working in it. We didn't pay benefits, so we saved the county a lot of money. So they're pretty happy. Next slide, please. And we were, uh, LaserFish ran this ad in The Economist one time. I was pretty proud to see that in there, that we saved five and a half million dollars. So here's a look at how the repositories kind of look. Uh, we host for many municipalities and many departments, and you just open up whatever you pick. So I would pick Tompkins County. It's based on Windows authentication. It's very simple to use. Next slide. It looks very Windows-based, so the end user is very comfortable. And what we did was we would go into each department um, and open their file cabinets and look at their, their desktop and see how they had their files set up. And then we made their folder structure in LaserFish mimic what they had. So here you can see this is my folder structure, annual reports, budgets, grants, contracts, things like that are in there under the county clerk. Next slide. Then we dive deeper, and then here's a slide showing in the in the budgets, the years, or the grants, the years of the grants, and I have each one in a folder. Next slide. And then inside one of the, the grant folders, here's all the documents that went into it. Uh, here we have uh, all the approval letters, the contracts, everything that had to be documented and maintained in there. And you can see from this here that there's different kinds of uh, files in there. So there's Word documents. There's PDFs, there's PowerPoints, there's, you know, zip files, we can put video files, we can put any kind of file created, uh, voicemails, anything in here, and it maintains it in there, and it will, we can transfer it back on the fly. It's really simple to use. Next slide. Um, so before I get into the user group, I'm going to go over LaserFish a little bit. So with LaserFish, um, not only is it comfortable to use, but we can automate things. So where that physical piece of paper used to go in the office or in the county, we can actually automate it now. So it flows very quickly and we can put time frames on it. So if someone hasn't looked at it in three days, it'll come back to you with an email and say, oh, you need to follow up on this. So we, we can automate all that. We also have electronic forms. So a lot of the time in doing all the scanning is the indexing of the documents which you don't have to do if you capture all that data from the constituent who uploads all that information into an online form for you. You just bring that in, you know, double check it, and then the indexing is done. It's a lot quicker. We also automated our FOIL process. 
So the city of Ithaca actually did it first, and then we share um, information back and forth, intelligence information back and forth. So they created this workflow, and then we made it, we took it to the county and we made it fit our needs. So where a, a FOIL request comes in now, it comes in from a form from the person at home, and it goes to the person who reviews it, it goes to the county attorney, then it goes, you know, wherever it has to be routed, which department, it has time frames on it, it has emails that go back to the person so that they know that you're working on it and not ignoring it. Um, my favorite thing to say about, you know, people always say government is hiding records, and we're not, we just can't find the records. Well, LaserFish has made it so that we can find our records. It's really, it's really been a great thing for us to use. Uh, another thing good about it was that it allows us um, for staff to work from home. So our judges or ADAs can go to different courts. They just take their laptops. Uh, the facilities guys don't need to drive big maps out in the rain now. They can take a laptop or an iPad out with the maps or the documents they need while they're doing things. And uh, I know back on Superstorm Sandy, back in 2011, 2012, there was a lot of flooding in the state where we lost, a lot of um, municipalities lost records. And I didn't want that to happen here. We're at the base of Cuba Lake. And when they, like the other day, the State Archives said, you know, something's coming up, there's going to be flooding, look at your records. I just sit there and I, I giggle every time thinking, I don't care because I don't have any paper records anymore. So I don't have to worry about my paper getting wet. Next. So then after we finished everything at the county, which was a, was a big thing, I saw, what can we do next? And at that time, State Archives was looking into uh, shared services grants. And I didn't know how to, to go about it, but I thought maybe if we approached a couple towns and see if they wanted to use our laser fish, we would host it. They would just pay for the support on the licenses. We would bring our IT to them and, you know, help them get things set up. My, my staff would help them along the way. I would write the contracts. I would oversee everything. So we walked into each government, and I thought maybe I'd get – you know, one or two on, and I ended up getting them all on. I did them incrementally over three years. So every town, village, court, and city in Tompkins County within three years was in our user group, and we, the county was hosting a laser fish for all of them to use. And what's good about it is we go out and we're there to help. We are never there to say, you know, you're going to do it our way because they have their own needs and their own records retention and all that. So they have their own dedicated repository. We stay in the repository as we are building it and helping them, you know, design it. But when they want us out, we just cut ourselves out so that we don't have access to the records anymore. So it's a, a very good – some um, municipalities keep us in the entire time. Some, you know, have their own IT staff and, and can do their own. Next slide. So like I said, currently we have all of the, the municipalities in Tompkins County. Uh, we also have Cortland County now. We're hosting for the county there and some of their municipalities. And we have bylaws, we have governance structure, we have policy and procedures. And this entire project has been covered by grant funds, uh, different grant funds. Some were state archives and some were from the Department of State, which I'll talk about a little bit later. One of the great things that happened during this was going out to the towns and meeting the people, we started making, building relationships. And in those relationships, I'd go into the records room and they'd be like, well, we have this stuff here. And I'd be like, but I've already scanned that at the county because it's a county record that we gave to you. You shouldn't have to scan it again. So all I would do is drag and drop the files that we already had here and share it with them. So it saved time. And then we just started looking at more redundancies, not just the, the records. It was like, oh, so you do this and we do this. And it's it just built this really good relationship where we can call each other up and work together and save money for, for um, constituents. We do have a website. It's right there on the screen. If you go to my um, website, just the Tompkins County Clerk, we have all this information on there. We have, um, and you can contact me at any time with any questions. I share grants. I'll share whatever I, I can help you with. Next slide, please. And some people said, you know, why did it work? Well, when I went out to these municipalities, I didn't say, I'm Maureen from the county clerk's office and I'm going to take over. You know, we were partners with them. We wanted, we worked with partners when we first started. We worked, um, picked partners that we'd worked with in the past and we knew that we could be successful. 
And then once we had those successes, it was easy to go out to the other governments that were a little more reluctant because then they were they're wanting to get in because they could see what we could do for them. And, you know, in the beginning, we had this huge, huge idea. And you know what? It, that's great because you got to start, but start small. But at least you know what you're finally going to, what you wanted to look for. And when I do my user groups, it's funny, um, I try to go out to them and their spaces because I don't want them coming to the county and making, like I'm running everything. So we go out to their spaces and we always bring food so everybody's happy. So it's been a really great, really great um, relationship we've had. Next slide, please. This is my favorite thing. Trust me, you're going to love it. You know, sometimes people like cling to, onto that paper for their lives are going to end. And I'm, I'm there to smile and I take it out of their hands so they're not looking. And I turn my head, smile back, and then they, they never miss it. Believe me, they never miss it. Um, I do this with the county because I don't want us keeping paper records. I don't do this with the town. They can, will return the records or whatever they want. But as a county, I can say, nope, no more paper. And I've had no one complain, no one, which is amazing because people love to complain. And like I said before, we make it very easy. We mimic their folder structure and either paper or electronic files. So when they open up LaserFiche, they're like, oh, this is what I'm used to seeing. So it's very simple to use. People use it, you know, because you can have the best software in the world, but if people aren't going to use it, it's not going to work. So. And at the county, we love it because it's a single software app application across all the multiple departments, and it integrates with so many different systems out there. Next slide, please. Yep, and that, I, it's really true. If you can have the best software in the world, but if they're not going, if they're not comfortable, they're not going to use it. Well, my end users use it, and one of the things we do is we're always available to help, even for the towns. You know. I, I, at the county, we don't do code enforcement, we don't do marriage licenses. Well, I know a lot about building codes and code enforcement and marriage licenses and dog licenses, and we've helped them build forms for it and everything, and just the, you know, it's been a great, great project. Next slide. So yeah, how do you pay for it? You know, so uh, over the years, I've asked for state archives grants, and uh, you can see back in 2012 is when I started working on the shared services ones. So, you know, it took us three years to get through all that. Uh, we did some additional things for some of our partners over the years. The newest grant uh, with Cortland County was a very big project. They were at almost maxing out their records facility. And so I had to get more money than what the state archives had. So I went to the Department of State and we got a grant for 603,000. So it was basically, basically a, it's based on cost savings. So it was a really good program. Next slide, please. So Department of State, that grant is called the Municipal Restructuring Fund, the MRF. I call it the Maureen Reynolds Fund. I'm gonna keep going back there and trying to get more money for some more grants. Uh, so it's basically sharing services and cooperation and it's, it's been a great tool for us to have. Next slide, please. Now, all this sounds great, and, you know, I don't have any paper here in the county, but some stuff we still have to keep in paper. I get that. I'm not the big, when I first met the historians in the county, I, they looked at me like I was the big paper thrower outer. I'm not. Um, so anything that is truly archival and needs to be stored, we rented uh, a storage bunker, underground storage bunker at the Seneca Army Depot, where we keep our permanent archival paper and microfilm storage. It's uh, temperature and humidity controlled. It was good enough to store nuclear warheads at one time, so I'm sure it's good enough for our records. So it's, you know, it doesn't flood in there. Everything's environmentally safe. It can't be broken into. It's just an amazing place to store records. And I have a next slide, I have a couple pictures of them. This is kind of what they look like up there at the Seneca Army Depot. And the next slide. Here's my corner lot up there, the depot. And those big doors are usually shut on the front there. You, you can la launch a nuclear um, missile launcher at them and it'll take a direct hit. In the old days, they um, had big concrete blocks out in front of the door. And then they say that no nuclear warheads were stored there, but 
they used to have something in there that would suck the oxygen out if it was breached and then like a big net of knives would fall over this this nuclear warhead that may or may not have been stored there. But now it's very safe for records. Everything's been test tested and it's safe and it's a wonderful thing that we have. So I've covered a lot very quickly. Um, I just want to tell you too, we have in 2015, we went to had Cornell, because we're based here in Ithaca, come down and do a cost saving study. And with the shared service, which we were doing back then in 2015, which were very small compared to what we're doing now, they projected that we would save taxpayers in our county, let me see how much it is, I think $3 million, $3 million, because at the county we're hosting for these, each of these towns, they don't have to buy their own software. They're using our network, they're using our IT to help, they're using our knowledge, we're doing the contracts, we're doing, you know, everything working with the vendors. And so that was just in the beginning. So that's just an amazing amount of savings that we've saved for the, the people here in Tompkins County. Um, another part of laser fish is uh, records management, which we do use. And what we do is like one, there was one place in the, county for contracts, they would keep the contracts just for one year and then replace it out with a new one when it came in. And what we would do is we would keep it for them to see for one year, which is what they wanted, and then we would maintain it the other six years in the background without them even knowing, just so that, you know, we always kept the legal requirements. So, like I said, if you have any questions, there's my email. I covered a lot very quickly. And I'm more than happy to help. That's it. So thank you. Thank you to both of our panelists. Um, Rich, do we have any questions? Yes, we sure do, Michael. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my sheet here that I've been transcribing these questions onto. I have a question from Becky for Bonnie. Uh, is Preservica able to distinguish between PDF and PDFA? I don't know if Bonnie is, uh, she's muted. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, <laughs> um, Preservica can uh, distinguish between PDFA and PDF. Um, in fact, it can also tell you which version of PDFA you have and the conformance level. I just took a quick look at the report I ran when I was putting this presentation together. We've got some PDF 1A, some PDF 1B, and some PDF 2B in our holdings at the moment. Okay, and then I have some questions here for Becky. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so your question from, I'm sorry, I meant Maureen. I'm reading for Becky here. A question for Maureen. Uh, from Abigail, what criteria do you use for selecting a third-party site for record storage? Well, we only use it for for uh, the really, because we don't store much paper. We have one bunker. And so what we did was we looked at it that was temperature and climate controlled and that it was safe, you know, from flooding and varmints and all that kind of stuff. And it was funny because I actually went up there because the thing, we do it through our fiber optics company, and they do, they have one bunker up there that's totally for data storage, and they won't even tell me who the clients are, so it's all for data storage. And we were going to look into that, but instead we did for paper and microphone, because like I said, it's it's been a very secure, safe, and it, um, I'm kind of cheap, and it's a, it was a good way for me to do this fairly affordably. Okay, uh, some more questions here from Maureen. Um, from, uh, Ab, uh, from Maria, uh, did you experience any pushback from departments that wanted to use different software for the records? And if so, how did you get them on board uh, or were certain compromises necessary? Oh, um, I, don't, I don't compromise. So um, with the software, you know, for day forward, laser feast may not be something that would meet the requirements for somebody in maybe planning or whatever, highway, they don't have the other software. But LaserFiche is what they use to store their records in and meet other legal storage requirements. 
And departments love it when you come in and do things for them. Because you're, you're, I'm like, I'm the one that's going to be worried about the records, not them. And some you know, people come and go, institutional knowledge comes and goes. So this was a good way for me to automate things because if they put it in as something, they pick the template and they pick the title of the document, it will assign how long it has to be maintained. So for them, it took a lot of the worry off of them and I sleep better at night now too. So no, I've, not, I've had no problems. Okay, and another question for you, Maureen, from Maria. How many county departments share the software and what have been some of the related benefits? Uh, every department in our county does utilize LaserFish, uh, so there's 29. And it, like I said, some people might use it for front state, for front software, and some will use it just in the background, and that's something that we discuss with them, with our IT and us. We have like a sit down with each department before we start on, or different projects they want brought up. But one of the great things I hear a lot in, um, you know, different department head meetings or something, they'll say, oh yeah, we're doing this new thing, and we have a laser fish form for that. You know, so we're, if, we're, if you're someone wants to sign up for, you know, the vaccine booster, or they want to do this and that, everything's captured now into laser fish and then routed either through their software, because it integrates very well, or as a, just a front state uh, facing software for smaller departments. Okay, and here's a question. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is for you, Maureen, or for Bonnie, but uh, it's about data. Uh, what is stated in your contract for data? Is it explicit about not sharing data? Uh, and you know, and do you officially own your data? We own our data. It's all on-prem currently. This laser fish that we're using currently is not in the cloud. We're probably going to move there eventually. But um, so we keep all the data here, and then we have you know, confidentiality, confidentiality agreements with um, either departments like the health department or HR or vital records, just, you know, we have all that with our scanners, but we don't, you know, have data requirements because it's ours it's here. We can do anything we want with it. Okay, and a little follow-up question there too. Do you have any plans uh, on how to, do you have plans uh, on how to move your data to another system? Yeah, it's very easy to move. Not a, it's not a problem at all. Okay. okay. And I have a question here about audiovisual files, which is mm -hmm. from Bonnie. Uh, I believe. Well, what formats do you use for preservation uh, for a long term? Is it native or something else? Um, it depends. Um, for the most part, uh, right now it's native simply because most things are coming to us in formats that. Uh, are you know still widely used, um, still intact over time? Um, uh, you know we're getting a lot of you know WAV files, a lot of MP4s, so on and so forth. Um, I actually have a colleague who focuses on dealing with our audiovisual materials. Um, she's really our expert in this regard. Um, but yeah, for the most part, right now we're just leaving those in the in the formats that they come to us in. Um, I should say, um, one of the things that I didn't mention is there is one other um, type of record that we house in Preservica. Um, our AV expert is overseeing a mammoth digitization initiative. We have a lot of analog audio and visual recordings, motion picture films that are deteriorating badly. We've determined that the digital copy will be the preservation copy. Um, and those are going into Preservica as well, and she is slowly moving terabyte after terabyte of data into our Preservica instance. All right, thank you, Bonnie. Um, got another question here for Maureen. Uh, does the system allow sharing records between the county and its municipalities for things like shared planning or zoning projects? Yes, so we can do that, or we can give limited access to certain folders. Um, every folder you saw on there, you can assign different rights to it. Um, you know, there's one folder I do for personnel matters here that's locked down only to me. So everything we can do, we can do like that. Uh, sometimes when the county has contractors that are bidding on projects, we'll put it up on, on we'll give them a link to a laser fee site that they have. We'll say it's, a, you know, available for 10 days and after 10 days goes away. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, Maureen. And, uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I do see is it's the comment here from uh, 
from Sarah. She said, very inspiring. So that was the portion from Maureen. I think your uh, your experiences have really uh, proven to some folks that uh, this can be done. Yeah, and I just want to let people know that this is not, I did not become a project manager ever. I, I didn't know I was doing it until I was doing it. I didn't know about electronic records. When I started in the clerk's office, you know, we still had the quill pens and microfilm. So it was just a process. And I just want people to know that you can do it. And we did it without spending a lot of money. We did it without a lot of, you know, it seems like a lot now, but it wasn't hard to do. So I just want people to try it. And so contact me if you have questions. Okay. And uh, I don't see any other questions, but I did want to let folks know that before they log off, if you happen to watch this presentation or this webinar in a group, if you can just give us that number. So if there's more than one, um, we can count you if there's just one person. But if there's, say, two, three, four, or 23 in a room, if you could put that number in the chat box, that will help us uh, get a sense of how many viewers we had. And, uh, Actually, yeah. there is one question showing up in the chat, and it's from Maureen. Um, what are some of the ways you have to coordinate with IT to support the system and data? Blackmail. <laughs> No, so, you know, I'm just very, I'm, we have a lot of communication. So we we have a user group that meets every two weeks. We go over projects. We go over, do we need more storage? Do we need this? Do we need that? So it's just a lot of communication. And if you come to me and say you want me to do your work, I'm not going to come in and do your work. So we, we kind of business process every request and make sure that, you know, this is something that's viable, it's going to work, and IT is involved in every step of it. So. But blackmail works too. All right. Um, so we've got about uh, eight or nine minutes left. So if anybody has any final questions they want to get in, please feel free. Um, other than that, I don't know if uh, any of the panelists or Michael, if you have any anything to add before we sign off. I actually have a question for Maureen. Um, I know that you're doing a lot of scanning. Um, I assume that you're focusing on more recent records and records that will ultimately be disposed of. Um, are you scanning any of your archival records? I have, yes. So we are scanning everything. OK. Um, and you know, one time we got slides. And I was like, OK, so we had to figure out how to do that and our conversion of microfilm. To digital, we, so we have different vendors that do different things. Uh, one time, I found a gun in a box, so I displayed the box on or the the gun on the scanner, you know, or took a picture of it. Um, so we've done about everything into Laserfiche. So yeah. Oh, um, I see here that there's a question about preserving websites. Um, I wasn't, uh, I didn't really have time to discuss it. And I'm glad you asked. Uh, we use Archivit. Uh, we currently use Archivit, which is a subscription service provided by the Internet Archive to produce copies of um, state government websites. And um, right now, uh, all of the, our copies of, of web data are housed in our, the Internet Archive's data centers. There's uh, a minimum of two and typically four copies of each uh, archived website uh, in those data centers, um, which are geographically distributed. Um, and uh, we also use Archivit's public interface to make those um, accessible uh, to researchers. Uh, the, web, the copies are produced in WARC format, which is a contraction of Web Archives format, which is the, currently the preservation standard for uh, archived websites. Um, we're likely going to have to perform some preservation actions uh, in the future um, simply because work is a package format. And so if you, say, have a bunch of HTML files and a bunch of PDF files and a bunch of JPEG files that make up a we uh, website, um, the work just kind of packages all of those PDFs, those, um, you know, uh, JPEGs, HTML files together. Uh, so it uh, might... Uh, 
you know, so it's likely down the road somebody may need, you know, as PDF changes, as other formats change, um, to go in and perform some preservation actions. Um, but right now, you know, we're just keeping an eye on those. Um, I can tell you that uh, if anything, um, as technology changes, some of our older copies actually look better now than they did uh, at the time that they were produced, simply because the rendering software that the Internet Archive has has gotten better, but we are aware that at some point somebody is going to have to likely uh, go in and um, do some format migration as technology progresses. And um, I just see a quick here, a follow-up before I yield the floor to Maureen. Um, how far do the website archives go back? They go back to December uh, 2006. Um, we produced our very first uh, copies as Governor George Pataki was leaving office. And Bonnie, I was going to ask, uh, I'm not sure if you saw this question, if you answered it, because I was toggling here between things. Have you ever had records come in on true floppy disks? Um, and she's talking about the 8-inch square used early on, maybe in the 1970s or 80s. And if so, how did you convert them? To a usable platform? Um, we've not gotten any 8-inch floppies, and frankly, if any come our way at this point in time, I would be, uh, I would suspect that they're not readable. We have gotten um, some of the uh, older, you know, 5 and a quarter inch floppies. Um, our colleagues in the State Museum have one computer with a 5 and a quarter inch drive. And what we've done is uh, copy the data off of the five and a quarter inch disks onto that computer, put them onto three and a half inch disks for which we have multiple drives. Um, we have also gotten some tape based uh, uh, transfers, you know, of older data tapes. And with those, we've worked with a vendor, um, you know, that has appropriate, you know, safeguards in place to produce copies that are then returned to us. And that's my roundabout way of saying that if we did get eight inch floppy disks and we determined that the data on them was truly worthy of preservation, we would work with a vendor um, to get copies of those. Thank you. I see there's a quest question for me. Yes. So the Born Digital Records, oh, this is my favorite topic. I, I'm sick of scanning. So. Born Digital is all I'm making them do in the county now. So if you're going to create it on the computer, you're going to stick it into Laserfiche. So you might have a working copy on your desktop, but anything that once you're completed or you're ready to store it, then it goes into Laserfiche. Um, and what software does it network with? Uh, pretty much everything we found so far is so it interfaces with. And it's one of the requirements in our purchasing for any software in the county is that we that the software that the department gets will have to integrate with laser fees for its legal storage requirements. Um, one other thing I've done too is you are not allowed to buy large amounts of paper, file cabinets, any kind of file storage in Tompkins County without talking to me first and justifying why you need to do it because it should be a conversation we have about getting rid of all that stuff and not storing paper because I'm done with scanning. So yes, Born Digital is what we're doing now. Yes, everything. Were there any more questions after that though? I don't see. I think that's it. I think that's it. I just wanted to thank both of you again uh, for being part of our panel, for both Bonnie and Maureen. And it sounds like you're constantly doing new things, new and exciting things with electronic records and making sure that they're going to be preserved over the long term. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Oh, and just one more quick thing. Uh, somebody asked about uh, me to me uh, in per person uh, chat to me uh, in person about uh, the recordings. Is this is this session recorded? And yes, uh, all of the New York State Archives webinars are recorded, and they eventually uh, are found on our New York State Archives YouTube site. And you can find that by I would just tell people just Google New York State Archives YouTube, and it'll take you right there. So thanks everybody.